we've got an interesting mob that I'm going to interview for you today. An extraordinary family, very talented, doing extraordinary stuff. If we were all a little bit like them, I think we'd save the world. And they live off their own work and produce their own vegetables and probably eat underground mutton as well. The first of these is Patrick Jones. His partner is Meg Allman and maybe we might even get to talk to their son Woody. Good afternoon Patrick. Hi Gillian, how are you? Thank you so much for coming on the show. Patrick, when did you start your conversion to a life outside all the constraints of city living? Uh, well, I, I grew up in country New South Wales, so I was fortunate enough to live beside a, a beautiful small creek called the Mittagong Creek and fish and yabby there with my friends and put up rope, rope swings and eat the blackberries along the creek and really just have a, a childhood that uh, we've tried to recreate for our own kids as well. Yes, it's it's the very very fortunate kids that are able to do that these days i remember having a uh, a piece of land that was very large myself when my kids were young but not many kids have that now no um or a common uh, or wild space just near them uh, in order to get a bit lost or build a cubby meet with their friends and sort of go under the radar of the adult sphere and yeah i feel like you know the some of the fear that uh, adults or parents have in today, uh, you know, is justifiable. But a lot of it, I think, is very much, um, you know, a, a, a kind of societal fabrication. And it, it's, yeah, it's something that Meg and I have had a lot of thought about and with friends as well, just about how, how do we reclaim that, a sense of childhood wonder and exploration outside of the gaze of adults 24-7. And I think, um, yeah, so we, we've really tried to recreate that. You've uh, taken yourselves to Dalesford uh, to take yourselves off the grid. How long have you been living in Dalesford? Personally, I've been there 25 years and I met Meg 15 years ago. So she's been there for 15 and uh but yeah before before that meg was uh grew up in in suburban melbourne and i as i said i grew up in country new south wales so you have you built your own house i saw a very beautiful little house for guests on your property uh and you you've got a dvd on the on the internet too many of them actually yes yes there's uh we we make little films about what we're doing yeah we're not entirely off grid we have a small uh, one kilowatt power system and we produce uh, we use about two kilowatt hours a day um the average australian just to give context to that uses um 18 kilowatts a day and the average american uses 28 kilowatts a day mm. so we are using still a little bit of uh electricity um, and what we, the surplus we produce uh, goes back onto the grid. So we're feeding our neighbours and people down the street, etc. When uh, when we've got surplus, so um, but we are off grid in terms of industrial food. Uh, we don't, um, we haven't eaten in supermarkets for over twelve years. We don't uh, own cars. We don't fly overseas. Well, nobody does these days. Um, but yeah, we we've just uh, we've we created a whole lot of limits. Um, uh, and uh, certainly purchase, we don't purchase new um, clothes and things like that so we op shop for our clothes So, and we grow a lot of our food or, or we um, uh, trade it uh, with, with neighbours and friends back home When did you start growing your own food? Well, my dad actually taught me to garden when I was a kid I kept a nursery all the way through high school which sort of paid for various different things as my kind of teenage job in a way but one that I um, created out of old pots and learning how to strike plants and propagate them and grow them on and uh, so I've always been growing something and then when I moved out of home I was always growing basil and tomato and you know, just a few things. Um, but it wasn't until probably my mid-30s when I met Meg and we 
we sort of put our envi different environmentalisms together. Um, did we arrive at permaculture and really started uh, studying and understanding the principles and the ethics, and they really aligned with where we'd that kind of, it all just sort of made sense and everything that we'd been doing beforehand um, now had a kind of a, a framework, I suppose, and, and also a community. So and we found ourselves in Dalesford and, and just down the road is David Holmgren, who's the co-originator of the permaculture movement with Bill Mollison. And he's since become a good friend and Meg works for David and Sue, uh, David's partner. And so, yeah, just over the years, we've just become more and more, um, uh, I guess, impressed with permaculture design and permaculture sensibilities and permaculture principles. And uh, we, we just put those into action, into uh, all ways, all, all forms of which we live. So whether that be um, our economic form, our food producing, our water saving, uh, the way in which we um, engage with our neighbours and friends um, and community back home, the different community projects that we do. So the social aspect of permaculture, the ecological and the economic aspects of permaculture, we, we completely embody. And, and now we're on our second big trip at a year, year on bikes where we're fishing for food and, and foraging a lot. Yes. Because obviously we're not around um, our, our garden. Um, so, yeah, this is the second time we've had a year on the road. Um, uh, basically just living, try, trying to uh, um, develop permaculture um, when you move, because permaculture is often based on settled, being in a settled place. Yes. So how do you do that if you're a climate refugee or you're a refugee for some other reason, like a pandemic or or um, how do you do it? And, and really not not doing it from that sense of fear, but actually sense of joy, because it's just um, meeting these challenges that our kids are going to probably have to face in the future. How yes. Do we, yes. How do we create joy, but also give them the skills that they're going to need in the future? Like moving around and knowing 100 to 200 different um, edible weeds that are coming up, you know, that we're basically standing on every day. How do you convert <laughs> that food into really good, um, nutritious um, tucker? It's a great skill, isn't it? It's very useful and you save lots of money, but it's also more healthy, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's one of the... I'm actually standing on a big patch of plantain at the moment, and plantain is such an incredible plant it's, it's mucilaginous so it, it's really good for the gut it ha it's, it's a coagulant so it's a good um, bush band-aid um, and the little seed heads are basically psyllium husks so they're really good for thickening soups and, and, and again for, for gut related issues so you know I'm just speaking speaking that's the the main weed that's under my feet right now um, and there's also some uh, buckthorn plantain as well as the narrow leaf so that it's the world is just full of abundance and unfortunately we have an economic system that um, um, it makes it look like the world is scarce of resources um, and so that that creates a lot of fear and a lot of worry about um, economic insecurity and Yet I, I sort of feel like, in a way, that what Meg and I are doing as parents, but also as permaculturalists, uh, are turning, turning those things on their head. And wherever we are, um, there is abundance of love and abundance of food and abundance of water and abundance of so what we call social warming, um, good social relations with people we meet on the road. Um, there's always, it's, it's just endless flow um, and life gives this endlessness of, of, of gifts or it, life is an endless gift but it's not, um, it's not about taking or extracting those gifts and making and capitalising on those gifts for us. It's, it's more to, um, to be in service to the flow of gifts. So how, how do we actually 
um, make those gifts flow ourselves, be participants in the, in the flow of gifts. Mm. You're actually reminding me of a little story I read last week. Uh, it was about a European bloke who went to a South Sea island and he saw a bloke uh, bringing a few fish in a net from the shore um, and he was going home and he said, how come you've only caught a few fish? And the bloke said, well, that's all I need to feed my family. And the bloke said, yes, but if you build a boat or get a bank loan and buy a big boat, then you could employ lots of people, make lots of money, and then when you're old, you can sit in the sun and enjoy your fish. And it seemed to sort of underline the really crazy monetary sort of aims of modern society. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's why that, that story is, is such a good parable for us too. And, and over the last uh, 12 years, we've decoupled ourselves from the monetary economy slowly, bit by bit, just starting starting with well, our cars, really. So um, going car-free has enabled us to be able to do things like go away for a year on bikes because um, the average car in Australia, um, these are NRMA and RACV figures, the average car is fifteen thousand dollars, and and the average household has spends about thirty five thousand dollars on on car on having cars and car use. Mm. So that's an enormous amount. That's pretty much a mor- another mortgage. So if you're locked into, I mean, some people have to have that for work. But I was a builder and carpenter, and I did the sums and basically thought, you know what, I, I'm better if I stay at home seven days a week homeschool uh, Woody and earlier uh, our elder boy, Zeph, uh, and basically grow our own food. And so herd goats, um, keep chickens, uh, raise ducks and bees and veggies. And that's such nourishing work. And I, even though I love being a builder, it was um, it's very de- demanding when you're building to pay the man and to pay your bills rather than actually building for the love of it or building for a friend to build a house because they've just had a baby and you know you want you want them to move into a into a place where they're going to be safe and happy and you know it's a very different relationship when you um when things get monetized as you just pointed out and so yeah we're now just 25 percent reliant on the monetary economy and that's pretty much our rent or our mortgage, uh, which is really the same thing in, in Dalesford. Unfortunately, they, they both cost about the same thing, although a mortgage gives you, obviously, security to, to grow fruit trees. And Yes, you, so. you got into this, didn't you, really, at the right time? Because now, if you wanted to buy a house or land, um, even just a house, especially in Melbourne, is about a million bucks. Uh, it's... It's such a travesty, and and again, it's that um, it's that cycle cycle of greed that just seems to well, it's not a cycle; it's a spiral of greed um, that's just aggregating every year. And it, yeah, what many people, um, particularly our age and younger, um, ca- cannot buy one house, while many many people have several, and it's just a system of of social inequality that's um and not only is a, a system of social inequality it, it, it actually um it's paraded as you know you are a successful person if you have a, have a, a big portfolio rather than you're a successful person if you're in service to your community yes and, and i think that the the shift that has to happen socially in order to to address all of our problems ecologically and socially is basically that shift from hoarding um, and hoarding resources, hoarding property to being a person in service. And once we move to that culture and move back to that culture for many, many cultures, uh, well, I think all cultures came came from that place of being in service. Um, Unfortunately for Western cultures, you have to go... uh, a long way back and it's almost like there's this belief that people of the west have just never had that level of um where the elders in the in the village are in service they're not in it to 
to take power from other people and control other people and manipulate other people. <clears throat> so um, you've really got, uh, you've been thinking. Um, you've actually been taking different attitudes towards how you educate your children too, haven't you? Yes, exactly. Well, I, I feel with all, all uh, they, I, we've got many friends who are teachers. My brother is a teacher. This is nothing about teachers because the teachers are suffering in the education system as much as the kids. They, there is a top-down um, uh, sort of control mechanism or, or sort of hierarchy that happens in the education system. It's all based on competition and compliance. And it, it basically, as the decades have developed, the education system has um, moved from it, uh, sort of rewarding creative um, and thinking teachers to punishing them. And so that, that the curriculum is handed down from the state and that teachers really just become facilitators of a, of a state model curriculum rather than a, rela a dynamic relationship between student and teacher or students and teacher in the discovery of life and the meaning of life and um, and the challenges that we face. So that, that the school system has become a schizophrenic system where on the one hand kids are uh, educated about things like climate change but uh, on the other hand they're siphoned into a work system or where you get the right results in order to go out and perform um, your economic duty in the very economy that's destroying the planet and making the climate unsafe. So it just seems very contradictory for us. I know it's a very radical place to end up, but it's um, what we've discovered with homeschooling is that... Um, when children direct their own learning, when they, uh, for example, fishing is just such a big thing for Woody now, but it's not just about catching the fish and the thrill. I mean, that's of course where the interest started. It's more about um, for him now, like what he's, he's observing. When the fish bite, what is happening with the tides? What is happening with the moon? What is happening with other animals? Is there a seal around? Because if there's a seal around, there's no fish biting. And so, <laughs> um, <laughs> so there's, you know, just the layered, complex learning that happens by just a child following a, um, a pursuit. He also plays music and he plays um, in our little family band. And so he plays um, violin or fiddle and he also um, is doing some... Um, uh, uh, percussion as well with a shaker and so you know there, there's so many different um, areas of interest but if there are a couple that are really speaking to a child a couple of areas then everything can be worked into or, or fed into that area so fishing itself um, is still enjoyed across the world by so many different cultures so there is still this sort of connection to um, food procurement from wild ecologies. Th that if fishing is, is a child's passion, then almost the entire schooling can happen through that. But because the accumulation of knowledge and understanding um, doesn't have to come through texts and books, they can be secondary and supplementary um, in the education, but the very first one is experience, observation, and participation. And that's where I feel like schooling is really, unschooling um, is really, or, or child-led schooling or child-led learning is um, really a, a dynamic way in which um, the child is educating him or herself to be lifelong uh, lifelong learners rather than um, what I went through and I'm not saying everybody goes through this at school but what I went through was just drudgery and I was in a forced learning situation um, I just 
I floundered and then I became a dis- disruptive student um, and, you know, I was often kicked out of the class. And so I was not ready to learn certain things at a certain age. Um, some things I learned very quickly and other things took me many, many years. So to even even to have these uh, homogenized templates about where children should be at a certain age is such an anxiety producing formula and there is so much anxiety in schools today not even before covid um and i think the anxiety that young people face uh, through a competitive education system um, really needs to be examined very carefully by the society that we live in so um, you've actually learned to do life skills like building. You, you've built mm-hmm. a small house on your property for yourselves and a sauna. Tell us about the sauna. Yeah, so the sauna um, is, again, made from materials locally uh, gathered, either from the tip with the, um, the external cladding, which is corrugated iron. Um, the internal um, uh, thermal mass is is sheep's wool, which again we got from the tip. Uh, And then um, the boards are are big rough cut cedar boards about uh, 16 inches wide uh, that we got from a local sawmill and it was from a cedar that had come down in a big storm. So uh, basically um, we created this little uh, box, we call it the cookhouse and Mm -hmm. we got a, again from the tip we got a an old uh, wood heater, and some friends gave us some sauna rocks, which we stick on top of the heater um, in a little tray. And we uh, we got a plumber to plumb it in just to be, make sure that there was no outgassing. And it's just for cold Highland snowy Dalesford. It's just um, yeah, part of our winter health health plan is to have a really good sweat and get out those toxins that you don't really sweat out so much in, in winter and then uh, go go outside into usually it's, it's about one or two degrees and then plunge into the icy plunge uh, tank that we've got next door or just outside and yeah just that I, I mean many cultures understand the health benefits of this of this radical um temperature uh, extremes um, and we do ice plunging in Lake Dale so during the during the winter but also um, yeah we've just been swimming through uh, along the coast on the, on the on this journey over the last couple of months which has been very invigorating as well it certainly would be I would call it rather challenging actually <laughs> swimming in freezing cold water <laughs> you get such a such a high and such a rush is a natural high you get um, after you come out all you have to do is just tell your brain that go in there the last five minutes I mean you start with one minute and build it up to two and and just when you come out you just feel uh, invincible really and since we've been doing doing that uh, for the last three years, neither of us had a cold or a flu. So it's kind of good timing, really, um, to uh, have started that um, that sort of health, which which we got from Wim Hof, who's a Dutch guy who brought tamu breathing from Tibet uh, into popularity, but he also did the tamu breathing, which is uh, quite a radical form of breathing, uh, which I won't explain here, but you can look it up. The Wim Hof method, um, where he uses the breathing and the um, ice plunging, as or cold water plunging, or cold showering, as a way to to really build immunity. So it's Wim V I M for Mary H O F. Wim, I think it's W. Oh yes. Uh, w I M. Yes. And then Hof is just. A H O F. Yes, and it's Tamu. Is it T A M U? T U W M O. T U. Tamu, Tamu breathing. Okay, so listeners, <laughs> you now have you can understand it a bit better. Um, and so, um, 
you've you've got lots of things going for you in the way of health and environment and not having an impact on your environment um you've also been preserving your own food i wonder if i i'm not trying to be sexist here but just to give your partner make a go uh, maybe she could tell the listeners about how you both go about preserving your food that's a great idea i'm just walking down to make now um yes so uh just uh, before i get to her i'll just say i'm the bread maker and makes the bread winner in our household so she <laughs> she works two days a week for David Holmgren. Um, but yes, yeah, she is the, the chief fermenter um, in our household. So apart from doing things like bread, um, Meg does all the ferments and all the medicinal ferments and things like that. But I'll pop, pop you on and here she is now. She can explain more. Thank you so much, Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Patrick. Hi, Hi Meg. Hi, Julian. Hi, Hi, Meg. Good to have you on board. Meg, we were just talking, uh, Patrick and I, about food, and I said, not wanting to be sexist, but realising that you have done a lot of fermenting and stuff with food and preserving it, um, maybe you would be able to tell the listeners about what you do so you've got a good supply of food for the winter when not so much grows. Yes, that's right. So I spend most of the autumn time... Uh, trying to fill our larder while Patrick spends his time trying to fill our wood stack. And we are, um, so I'm preserving, we ha I collect all throughout the year, I collect jars and I preserve uh, as many fruits and vegetables as I can, as well as uh, making as many ferments as I can that I think will last, last the length uh, of, of the winter. And I really try to make sure that I have enough food uh, to last until the seasons start again. So if I can have, if I try to make as much passata, for example, so tomatoes in jars, um, until the, I have the first tomato picked from our vine the next season. Oh. Next so I try to make things last as long as I can. Talking about passata, what do you put in your passata? So I have the tomatoes and we have a very short growing season uh, where we live. So I have um, a pick a whole lot of the tomatoes and if they've touched the ground and I give them a quick rinse, I put them in the food processor and then I boil them up and then that's all I do. And then I, I collect jars so they're not foul as the cola or anything fancy like that, they're just the regular pop lid jars and I try to have a whole lot of different size jars. So if we're just cooking for us, then I have a smaller jar and if I'm cooking for us and friends and volunteers then I have the larger jars and then I just put the hot liquid into the hot jar and that's it and because the tomatoes are quite acidic you don't need to add anything else all oh, right, because I did lots of tomato preserving uh, over the last 12 months and I had to put lemon juice and garlic in so yeah because of the acidity levels is that why uh, well, it was just recommended in order to not have any bugs growing in your preserves. Yeah, so as long as you boil it and put the hot liquid into hot jars, you don't actually add to need and you don't need to add anything else. Although it's nice to have those things because they add flavour, of course, especially the garlic. Um, but with the garlic, we also you have to be careful of botulism because that's uh, that's a thing too that you can do. But also, I put I have. Um, put lots of basil and greens and things like that in passata but these days i don't bother i just do straight tomato okay you're saying that um garlic is good for killing off botulism no it can cause botulism oh that's very interesting okay. yes <laughs> you might need to look that up <laughs> <laughs> okay. and so people, you can get ph uh strips I know some people who preserve with those strips just to make sure they've got the pH level, but that's a bit scientific for me. I just I just do it on intuition. All oh, right, and you're really into making all sorts of things, aren't you? Um, craft, I am. for instance. Yes, so I love sauerkraut. We do try to have something fermented with every single meal that we eat. So we might have some yogurt in the morning and some um, some sauerkraut or some pickles for lunch and maybe something with some homemade miso in it for dinner, something like that. Or lots of condiments are always, always around in the cellar and in our fridge and in the, in the cellars and fridges of our friends as well because 
because we live in such a, um, a community where we do so much trading with each other and big part of our storage, I'm sure Patrick told you about, is being part of the gift economy. And so having the bench, which is very high value in the gift economy, so if, <laughs> if we have something um, that we would like to trade, then often, often um, a ferment, a ferment uh, goes one way and something delicious or, um, or greatly appreciated comes back the other way. Do fermented foods last longer? They last longer if they're kept cold. So as our food decays, we want to stop it at that point before it becomes uh, inedible. So before you throw it into the compost bin. <laughs> so um, the, to ferment something fresh is best. Um, so if you have a cabbage, you can leave it in the fridge for a while and then just before you think, oh, it's, it's past it, then I might ferment that. But it is actually best to uh, ferment food, ferment vegetables and fruit uh, as, soon as, yeah, as soon as you pick them, so as soon as they're harvested because that's when they'll last the longest. And so when I make my kraut, um, I just slice the cabbage and pound salt into it so either with my hands or I've got a sauerkraut basher which is a rolling pin that's lost one of its handles <laughs> and then I'll stick it in a crock or a jar until it's fermented and, and make sure that it's got no air bubbles in it and then after two or three weeks weeks depending on the temperature of our house at the time then it's ready and then I'll either uh, store it in the fridge if it's just a small batch or in the cellar if it's a big batch and if it's kept cool it can last up to six months to a year depending on what it is yes yes and of course people have been fermenting for thousands of years and yeah this is just a part of our recent reclamation of our ancestors um uh, traditions but it's now a big part of our own tradition and I also started uh, five or six years ago a local community group we call ourselves Dalesford Culture Club and uh, we're a group it's a free group anyone can come along we ha have it once a month and we ferment anything that we can that's in season at the time so we have um, yeah, lot, we have a community pickling day, community crowding and kimchi making days. We make apple cider vinegar and apple cider during apple season. Uh, we have special guests who teach us how to make sourdough and uh, we've had cheese making days and wine making days. And we have, um, just before winter, we have medicinal fermenting sessions so we can all store, you know, start storing lots of uh, goods for when you start to feel a bit vulnerable or you have a little tickle in your throat, then you can just go to your fridge or your pantry and grab it, some fermented garlic or um, the fermented turmeric and ginger and have that. Uh, what other herbs are good for people's health? Um, sage is really great. So we've all, when, you know, when you walk around the garden, um, most of us have got some herbs or at least we've got some weeds growing. Um, and we've, I do ferment a lot of um, weeds as well. Um, but sage is really fantastic. Um, it's good for the throat if you have a sore throat or a tickly throat or a dry, a dry cough, that's really good. And something that's really, really simple that I like to do is just go and pick a whole lot of herbs from rosemary, which is really good for circulation and especially in the colder months. And, of course, it's really good for our memory too. So I might pick some, um, some sage and some thyme, um, and all of these are anti-inflammatory as well and maybe put some ginger in it and then chop it up really finely and just stick it in honey and then you'll need to burp it which in fermenting language is release the lid and um so loosen the lid to release the carbon dioxide so i'll and stick it in honey for a month or so and then you can strain it out and then you have this beautiful fermented medicinal honey so which is really great just to have when you have a yeah a tickly throat and of course everybody loves it or you can stick it into warm water with a splash of apple cider vinegar and you know put a pinch of pepper in there as well and something that i recently learned about pepper is that it makes the vitamins and minerals in food more bioavailable so I've been, since I learned that, I've been, I mean, I love pepper anyway, but I've been putting extra pepper <laughs> in everything. But I've done it quite slowly to build up Woody's tolerance, which is our nine-year-old. So bit by bit, he's now able to have more spicy food because I've just done it ever so slightly. <laughs> now, getting away from food preserving, uh, you're really into craft and music, aren't you? Yes, we are. Yep. So the craft, I think, comes from not just from the wanting to make something, but it's also to, to for us to take responsibility for what we are 
consuming and what we are creating in this world. So really trying to um, be more producers than consumers. So that's a big part of what we make. So we have goats, for example. So we, um, when we slaughter a goat, we try to use every single part of that animal, including its its hide. So we're tanning it, we're making uh, clothes, we're making... Um, We've been making some shoe templates, just trying to experiment with just the, the fibre of the hide and see what we can what we can make with it. So that's been a really, a really fun and experimental thing that that all of us are interested in, including Woody. So that's been great for one of his his unschooling projects. Yes, if you're making shoes, would you have to take the fur off? Uh, you don't. No, you don't need to. Well, you can put the fur on the inside, which is really lovely. All right. Or you can just put them on the outside. Yeah, so the, it's the, yeah, exactly. So it's the sole of the shoe, but you can just do a few layers of the hide and okay. just maybe knit, knit some very warm socks. <laughs> and, we, and we do love playing lots of music together. So that's been, yeah, a really big part of, um, yeah, our lives together is just playing music because there's nothing like playing music together and singing collectively. And, yeah, that's just been very, very, very joyous. So Patrick plays the guitar, Woody plays the violin, and I play the recorder. I've actually listened to you online, and you must have some skills that I don't have to be able to put that online. Tell the listeners about your YouTube videos. So our YouTube channel, we call ourselves Artist as Family. So if you go to YouTube and then just type in Artist as Family, three separate words, and it's an archive of our thoughts, of our makings um, for the last several years. I don't know how long we've had we've been on um, YouTube for, but a while. And we we write songs and we make video clips, and most of it's lots of how-to videos, how to skin a rabbit, how to make rabbit liver pate, how to make sauerkraut, all the different ways that we preserve apples in apple season. Um, yeah, lots of different things like that that we do. So just trying to share our skills because, you know, we 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 really believe very strongly in community sufficiency, not self sufficiency. So really trying to share these skills and do it in a in a very generous and non monetary way because that's a way that the information has been shared with us. So it feels really right just to to translate it into what you know how we do it, what we've learned the knowledges that we've reclaimed and acquired and then sharing that with other people. Yes. So how does um, how does Woody, how did he uh, uh, learn the violin? Does he want to talk about that or would you prefer to talk about it for him? Um, yeah, I think he's feeling a little bit shy today. Okay. <laughs> I don't really blame him. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so Woody is unschooled, um, which means that he has no uh, formal curriculum that we follow with his education uh, but he does have two formal classes a week he has uh, a violin class with a uh, local teacher who he, he comes over to our place and when the restrictions are on they just do that via zoom um, and he also is part of a clay cooperative that's in our local area and that's called clay space so he goes there once a week and he uses the wheel and he makes bowls and um, cups and all kinds of things and platters and signs and yeah little sculptures so um, loved, that, really of course that. you wouldn't be able to do that right now because of uh, the the virus i suppose but you're That's actually right. stuck in warnable aren't you because of the virus we feel very lucky to be stuck in warnable at the moment <laughs> <laughs> so we arrived uh the day before lockdown most recent lockdown and yeah we've been very generously put up by some friends in their their granny flat so we have a space to ourselves, which is really great. Um, and, yeah, we're fishing every day on the jetty and, yeah, just getting to know this local area. Oh, wow. Uh, I'm thinking, because um, I think I mentioned to you that uh, we and the Warnable Pipe Band go to Dalesford when it's not a virus running around the country. Um, so we'll have to come and visit you sometime. Um, and I see your that. wonderful garden. How big is your garden, by the way? So our property is a quarter acre. Yes. And what isn't um, house and tiny houses is under food production. And we've also got chickens, ducks, bees and quails. 
Yeah, so it's a, the whole property is a quarter acre, but on that quarter acre we really build it. So we have 150 different fruit and nut trees and um, large growing areas. So we have a perennial garden as well as an annual garden. It's a wonder you can fit 150 trees on a quarter acre to quarter acre so, block. Yeah, so we have well, they're, they're pretty small trees. We've got mostly dwarf fruiting yes. varieties. Um, because we have uh, lots of hungry cockatoos in our area, like probably most places in Australia. Yes. Um, and we, um, so we net them, we keep them really small, and we can get, you know, 50 to 100 fruit on each tree. So that's a lot, that's a lot of produce. So if they're pruned, if they're pruned in a, a specific way. That's amazing. Uh, do you espalier some of them? Yes, we do. Yep, oh. so we have uh, quite a few. So on one of our, um, Instead of having a fence on our south side with our neighbours there, so we have an, a spalliard, uh, like a living fence, so we have a spalliard fruit trees between our fences. And listeners, if you don't know how a spalliard works, uh, look it up on the internet. It's fascinating. It really is. Meg, this is so this is so incredibly uh, educational. Just talking to you two about your lifestyle—it's so inspiring. Have you got a message for everybody before you finish up? Turn off your TVs and turn off your laptops. It's so easy at the moment to get swallowed into the story of fear and the the story of I don't know. It's it's so troubling what's happening in the world. But it's also springtime here and just walking around the streets is just so many blossoms and so many bees and so many insects and birds and it's such a magical time and, you know, where it's such a privilege to be alive and I think the virus has showed us so many things and one of them is how wonderful it is to be alive and the other one is how precious so many connections are and particularly with people but particularly just with the living world I'm just looking at a snail climbing up a fence at the moment I've got my hand on zero there are so many little um, weeds coming up in the cracks here of the pavement you know there's just there's just so much life around us and we're, we're part of that we're not separate from that so I think just you know being being grateful and just really honoring ourselves as as part of life I think yeah that's probably where I'd like to end yes it actually reminds me of the First Nations sort of um, philosophy really that's right and that we're 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 all connected and we're all as important as each other you know whether we're we're a tree or a stone or a wind or a bird or a whale i mean that's another thing we've just been seeing whales here in in warnable it's just so special to see the mama whales and their calves so meg um when the lockdown is finished where are you going next when the lockdown finishes we are going to uh, head towards port ferry Mm -hmm. And if the border is open uh, to South Australia, then we'll continue that way. Um, but it's looking like it won't be, so other in that uh, in that case, we'll just continue round Victoria. And you know how lucky because it's such a beautiful state, and we'll just head up to the high country. And Woody is crazy about fishing, so we'll just go to the Murray and just yeah, travel around. And you know, this is our third lockdown of our trip, and. Of course, we want to be travelling, but it's also really lovely to have these lockdowns because it really, we embed in places and get to know it on a much, you know, a deeper level as we can in just a few weeks. Um, but it's a really special time just to be still and just to notice things in a particular bioregion instead of just wishing past it. So yes, and in the meantime, I suppose uh, Woody is learning his geography. Ex exactly. He, he's meant he's learning learning lots of things, and one of the things that he's brought up, been brought up with is how to live within limits, and that's another lesson that we're all learning with these lockdowns: is how to live with, with the limit of geography. And it's not such a bad thing just to really get to know your local walker sphere, we call it, or your local biosphere. Thank you so much, Meg, and also to Patrick and to Woody uh, for this very interesting show. I have enjoyed talking to you more than anybody I've ever had on this show in about 25 years. Thank you so much. 
Oh, thank you so much, Gillian. Lovely to chat with you. Uh, if you want to learn more about Meg Allman, Patrick Jones and their son Woody, um, you can go and look on YouTube for Artist as a Family.